I am so, so, so hungry. This time change thing, it's the stomach thing. I know you guys are too, so what I'm going to try to do is get to the point today. We're glad to be here. We're thankful for the benefits of the time change, but certainly lunch is not one of them. I'm also very thankful to be here. I don't want to talk about myself for long, but preaching and teaching is my favorite thing to do in the whole world. My whole week is built around this opportunity a couple of times to share with you things that I'm learning in scripture, ideas that come together in a way that's changing me and hopefully will help you grow. It's what I get to do and I'm thankful every week. Some weeks it just is a little bit more exciting and enjoyable than others when I see things in scripture that I've never seen before that God is comparing and connecting in ways that really open my eyes, like the song we sang, and getting to share that with you is just a wonderful occasion. And so we're going to do that today. I'm going to show you two stories in the book of Genesis. You're welcome to have your Bibles open to the earliest of the chapters, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I want to show you two interactions between God and in particular two women in these stories. And the stories look like they're a world apart. They look like they don't relate at all. But what's interesting about them, I hope you'll see today, is that they're just opposite enough. It's just an inversion of circumstances enough that they click together and connect in a really interesting way to me. And so I'm going to show you that. Now, to get us rolling in the right direction, to give some imagery to you, I'm going to show you a couple of images on the board. This is like second grade PowerPoint level stuff. I have never been good at slides or graphics or such. So this, I mean, your grandkids could build this and they may not even be born yet. I mean, it's that basic. But I do think it can help you think along some certain lines. So hang in there with me. I want to share with you this particular image. Now, it's a little bit dampered by the projector, but this is a large, bright yellow box. This is the brightest yellow that you can get on the computer program. And so when I have you look at this box, my first question is, what do you see when you look at this? The thing about bright colors is when you get a lot of it together, that's what you see. I mean, personally, when I built this box and was practicing in here and looking at it, I thought, I see a big yellow box, a big, bright, pretty box. But most of you notice that there is a little annoying dark square right in the middle of it. Maybe it's not the first thing that you notice because brightness tends to attract your eye. But I would wonder if you looked at this box every day, if it was on the wall of your living room or something, and every day you took a peek at that box, what would you eventually call that box? Would you eventually say it's just a big, beautiful yellow box? Or would you always say it's a box with a little dot in it? The thing about the dark colors is that when they're on a light background, you just never don't see them. And so while there's two colors there, and I'm going to tell you about the two colors in a minute, it initially is big and beautiful, but I don't know. The little, the little bug in the middle would probably bug me for the rest of my life. Now, I'm going to show you a second image. Nothing has changed in terms of size. In fact, nothing has changed at all. I've just inverted the colors is all. The blue is the dominant. The dark blue is the dominant figure. And so same initial question. If I said, hey, Zach, you're like, what do you see? You go, I see a big blue box, you know. And if you saw it in its real colors, you'd see it's a really deep, deep blue. But you would also notice that there's a little square in there and it is yellow. It's a little harder to figure out that it's yellow because when the brighter colors are lesser, they're not quite as dominant to me. In other words, on a bright background, I would always see that blue dot. But I think eventually, if I stared at the blue one every day and I went, there's a blue box, I might eventually kind of get used to the lighter color and forget it. That may not be the way you think, and I'm definitely leading you somewhere, so I'm trying to like influence your thought. But whether I influence your thought or not, all I want you to see right now is these are two interesting, opposite, but related boxes. Now, for the purpose of our study today, however you see the big boxes, little boxes, or what dominates your thinking, I want you to think in terms of light or darkness. I've chosen a dark color because it represents dark things. It represents things that are not of God, things that are not from God, and things that God does not want you to be a part of. That's the dark part of life. And so obviously the language of scripture is that God is light and Jesus is light and the gospel is light. So the bright colors are the great things. They're the, they are God. They are the blessings of God, the abundance of God, the great things of God. And in both of these images, your temptation, your temptation is to focus on the dark thing. Your temptation here is to overlook all of the bright things and get stuck on the dark thing. And your temptation over here is to see so much of the dark thing, the absence of the blessings of God, what is lacking that eventually you stop noticing that there is a deep brightness there. 
Now that's sort of the purpose of the day is trying to figure out which of these you stare at the most. And if you opened your eyes to the Lord, how would it change which one you focused on? But I think by way of introduction, it's worth kind of maybe asking you which one of these best describes your life right now. I think if we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, we'd get a lot of, well, it depends what day of the week it is, or, or it depends who I'm around, or, or probably it's somewhere in between. But if you had to pick one of these, like, no life is perfect. No life is without struggle and some darkness and some fear. So you're going to have some blue in your life. But which one is you? Would you say this is you? How many of you are saying, you know what? My life is like jam-packed filled with the blessings of God. I see abundance everywhere. I celebrate the goodness of God and God's people and the blessings of the word and the beautiful, like November in Northeast Texas is our, that's our banner month. I mean, it's so beautiful and wonderful out there. Are you someone who goes, life is generally actually pretty spiritually and literally amazing, but there are these little spots in it that try to draw my attention. Is that you? I think that's a lot of people here. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and boast about it, but I hope that's you. That's a great place to live. And if you can stay there, stay there. But is there anybody else today who's in a different box? Maybe it's health, maybe it's family, maybe it's life, maybe it's the economy. I don't know what it is, but basically you would say, Chris, to be honest with you, I'm a little bit more over here right now. There's a lot of, of what lacks in my life. There's a lot of fear and doubt and trouble that does not feel like it is of God. It certainly doesn't originate from the heart of God. And I'm having trouble seeing the bright spots. Is that, is that you? I think at times we fluctuate between the both. I'm going to show you two stories in Genesis. One is represented here, and the other is represented here, but they're ultimately the same story. The same story is no matter what life circumstance you're in, is Jesus and his promises and his kingdom and his people and his love so dominantly bright that you can pursue that and not be distracted by the darkness. Two life situations. Here's the first one. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2, if you have not done so already. And I'm going to talk to you about Eve in the garden. Adam is a part of this too. And he's the first one you're going to read about in chapter 2. But ultimately today, it's the picture of two ladies. There were men involved in both of these ladies' lives. But it's ultimately about kind of the way these ladies process what is in front of them. And so Eve becomes a dominant figure. Eve was in a place of great brightness. I don't think there's anybody who would say the Garden of Eden was, was dark or depraved, or insufficient. It was a sinless, beautiful, vibrant, luscious garden designed by God, untainted or untouched by sin. There were these massive rivers that ran to the west and to the east of it, and little pieces and creeks that would come off. It was flowing river water straight through the middle of this thing. It was probably the best place you could ever live on the planet. And God made it. And God made other things too. I want you to read with me in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying, after he had made all of this, he puts him in the garden of Eden, verse 15. He says, it's yours. You keep it. You cultivate it. It's for you. But he said, verse 16, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, we typically skip to the devil in chapter 3, and I almost did that in preparing for this lesson. I want to get straight to the devil, pointing to that tree in the middle. And by the way, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that which they should not have, God put it right in the middle. He didn't put it over on the edge where you could just avoid it. He didn't put it in some corner where you could just decide, we're never going to live over there. The text says in chapter 3, verse 3, that he put it right in the dead center of all of it, just like the graphic you see behind me. But the devil didn't do that. This is what I want you to get. The devil didn't do that. God did that. You've got to come to grips with the fact that when God built the perfect, most beautiful, sinless, glorious place, put man in it, he noticed that man needed things. Verse 18, you need a helper, I'll give you one. And so he gives him a wife. He builds this perfect, beautiful life circumstance. It's a God. He is a God of abundance. And he gave them total abundance, everything that they needed. In verse 25, they lived without shame, without guilt, without sin. They were naked and they did not care. God built abundance, but God also put the blue dot in the middle. Satan didn't put it there. God did. From the very beginning of man's existence, here is God's message to you. 
I will fill your life with joy and peace and hope, but I will also place a test before you. I will place something, listen carefully, that you must lack. We don't like that. I'm in America. I know I got to be careful. We don't like lack. We don't like the idea that there's something I can't have, that there's something that is not of God. We want abundance in everything. He said, I'm designing life to be abundant, but I'm always going to have some lack in your life that you don't need, and I'm asking you not to go and get. So if you're going, I've got this great life, but there's these things. God, God made the opportunity for those things because you need those things. You need lack in your life in order to make a choice that is... Don't ask for the blue dot to disappear. Ask for the yellow to fill your vision. Now, the devil comes in. We know what he does. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The devil comes in. He was crafty. He was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God said you shall not, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said, Well, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. There's going to be some focus on eyes in these stories. I'll come back to it at the end, but I want you to note it. Your eyes will be open. God's keeping you in the dark. Your eyes will be opened. You will be like God knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the, tr the tree was good for food, it was delightful to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Those eyes got opened, all right. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. We talk about this story a lot, about how the devil uses the same three tricks, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. Tried it with Jesus. It's laid out in 1 John 2, and he tried it here. But I want to back up and forget about all that for a minute. I just want you to see the one main idea of what the devil's doing. The devil is saying, no matter how much God has given you, no matter how he wants to bless you, no matter what he has designed for you, it is what you lack that matters most. You will always be a little bit short of what you could be. And in fact, he almost makes God adversarial. Like God creates this thing you can't have. And he makes you think he's trying to help you be disciplined, but he's actually trying to keep you from more. And so you deserve to have that. And so what he asked her to do is look past all the yellow and see the blue that God had placed there. And you need this. And so they did it. I was uh, watching a video by a guy who was talking about this the other day, and he listed a bunch of fruits. I realized I'm not good at naming fruits, so I'm not going to say it this way to you, but here's the, here's the tree in the middle, and they walk past all the apple trees like, I don't want any apples. I'm tired of apples. I'm tired of oranges. That's all the fruit trees I can think of. <laughs> Plums. I don't know. You, we keep going. I'm tired of it. I, you know, I don't, and they're walking past. Listen carefully, because this is what we do. They're walking past all this abundance. You couldn't even get to the lack without walking. It's in the middle. Without walking past all the abundance and deciding the abundance isn't enough. And it isn't good enough. I've got to fill the hole that God says needs to stay empty in order to be filled. Well, their eyes got open. And so these are the temptations that we face. So don't ask for the blue dot to disappear. Ask for yourself to understand what God is doing with it and what the devil wants you to think about it. All right, let me show you a second story. By the way, a couple thoughts here. God is the God of abundance. God is the God of provision. God is the God of life. God gives you plenty and more than plenty and all that is needed. Satan is lowercase g. I recorded this last week in an episode, and I said it over, lowercase g. Satan is the, the God of lack. Like his whole, his whole deal is what God won't let you have is the thing you need the most. I just want you to hang on that phrase a little bit because it sounds stupid when I say it. It sounds like that's the dumbest idea and yet there's something about us that cannot take our eyes off that thing that we do not have. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we studied the no line? We don't like that. I don't like a line that says I'm going to get this and not get that. Let me show you a second story. It looks like it has nothing to do with the first story. It couldn't be more opposite, but it's certainly not a garden. But I want to talk about another lady in Genesis chapter 21. How many of you are familiar with the story of Ishmael, the son of Hagar? Who's familiar with that story? Abraham was promised that he would have a son. He, uh, Abram and Sarai were told that they would have a son of promise, but years started to pass, you know, and it wasn't happening. And so they came up with this idea. The idea was, hey, I think we can make this work. So 
God's probably telling us we need to kind of figure this out on our own. So here's what I want you to do, Abram. I want you to have relations with, with my handmaid, Hagar, and we'll just get this thing going. And so Abram does that, and Hagar has a son named Ishmael. And they're told pretty soon afterwards that, no, that was, God was like, be patient. And you weren't patient, and so Ishmael was not that son of promise. So God comes back a few years later. We don't know how long, but just a few years later. And God comes back and says, all right, now I'm ready to do the thing I want to do. And Sarah, at the age of 90, is, has a child or is, or is pregnant and then, and then has, has Isaac. Well, a few years pass. I think Ishmael is probably still pretty small, but... Sarah's really sensitive now about Hagar's presence. It's interesting, this is a whole different study, but she kind of created this problem and now she wants it to be gone. It's kind of, well, remind me to get back to that in a couple of weeks. I mean, this is her idea and now we're kind of, she's kind of stuck with it, but she thought she was. But something happens where Ishmael mocks baby Isaac or something. I mean, he's probably still a kid, but she's super sensitive. So she goes to Abram and says, we got to do something about this. Like Ish Ishmael is mocking or somebody's mocking. And so what I want you to see is God is a part of all of this. And Abram goes to God to say, what do we do with Hagar and Ishmael? And as we pick up in our text, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 21. And this happens back in verse 5 and verse 9 is the mocking and, and verse 11 uh, she says, drive this maid out, get rid of it, and get rid of them. And Abraham's greatly distressed. But God, verse 12, God said to Abraham, so God's a part of this. God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid, Ishmael and, and Hagar. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. And the son of the maid, I, I will, I'll take care of him. I'll make a nation also because he, Ishmael, is your descendants. So Abraham was always right on top of things. It's kind of part of his faith. So he rose early in the morning and he took bread and a skin of water, not much, gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, gave her the boy who's, I don't know, three, five, seven young. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Bathsheba. So I'm going to pause there and I want you to see the juxtaposition here. Hagar's story is nothing like Eve's story in terms of abundance or lack. In Eve's case, she had everything in the entire world she could ever need and one little thing she could not have and it ended up eating her and Adam both alive. In this case, it says she's not in a garden, but verse 14 says she's sent out into the wilderness. I mean, think about this. She, she thought she'd had the son of promise. She thought she would be cared for by Abraham, a man greatly, but she thought she was going to live her life in the garden. Wouldn't you think that? I'm going to live in the garden of Abraham's blessings. And all of a sudden, she is cast out with one skin of water into a depraved and dry wilderness. And who did it? Who did it? God did it. You go, oh, she must be very, very sinful, or she doesn't belong anymore. God's angry with her. She's done nothing wrong, not one thing wrong. And God said, send her out with nothing but my promises. Ooh, we could talk about that all day. We're going to put her in the wilderness. We're going to make it seem very dark and frightening. But I promise I'm going to take care of her. And I hope Abraham connoted that. It doesn't necessarily say Abraham told her that, but I sure hope they did. Now, I want you to see what happens. Verse 15. It's just one skin of water, you know. It's not a garden with a river flowing through it. It's a wilderness of one skin of water. When the water in the skin was used up, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him about a bow shot away, for she said, do not let me see the boy die. You want to talk about wilderness, darkness, sorrow? Does it get any worse than this? You and your child? No water? Can't even watch. He's dying and you don't want to watch it. It's about as wilderness as it gets. She sat opposite him about a bow shot away and she lifted up her voice and she wept. God heard the lad crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, I'm really sorry for what you're going through. Is that what it says, Chris? No. This was not, this is what God said, this was not my doing. This is just to sit, did he say any of that? Here's what he said. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, Hagar? Now, if she had her moment, she'd go, God, you ready for this? Because I'm ready to answer you on this. I was selected to be the one who bore the son of promise. I bore the firstborn son of Abraham. He is in the line of the descendants of the blessings. There was some little mocking thing. It wasn't even a big deal. 
and boom, we're all kicked out with one thing of water. I'm in the wilderness. What do you mean what's a matter? I could see her maybe doing that. But I'll tell you this, God didn't come in and go, this is so unfair. God is the one who put her there. He said this, what's the matter with you? Do not fear, for God has heard, this is the angel, God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. I love this. Remember the eyes? And this is kind of our great song earlier. Justin really nailed it, but remember the eyes? Open your eyes. I want to see Jesus. Here's what the Bible says. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with the water and gave the lad a drink. God was with the lad and he grew and he lived and it all worked out. And his seven sons became seven princes and they owned a whole bunch of land and everything God said came true. This is so interesting to study this. It's wilderness. There's no water. They're dying. She cannot see the well. I do not believe you can disagree with me later. And it's okay. I think if you do, but I don't think God just like dreamed up a well. This well may have been there for 10 years, 100 years, a thousand. It's a well. And it doesn't say he created a well. He said he opened her eyes to see the well. Do you know where she was? Can you feel where she was? That well was right there the whole time. Right there. If she had searched for it, she probably would have found it. If she had believed that God would provide it, she definitely would have found it. But she was too caught up in the darkness of the wilderness and she could no longer see the light. Do you know what that feels like? It's my fault. It's God's fault. It's everything is broken and God's going, listen, no, wait, like this is not where I want you to live forever, but this is where I am, I almost say putting you or I'm allowing you to go because sometimes the tests are very different, but it's the same test. Do you get that? It's the same test. In the garden and in the wilderness, the test isn't the same. The amount of darkness and fear and doubt. And in the first story, it was a sinful darkness. And in the second story, it was just life bites darkness. But in both of those cases, you find the light. And so she at least cried out to the Lord. And I got to tell you, at least do that. At least. If you can't see the well and you don't know where the water is and you don't understand what's going on, maybe you can't see it. It's there. It's there. God's with us. But would you at least cry out to the Lord for that? Open my eyes, Lord. Show me the light. Because the text didn't say God sat around and watched her until she figured it out. The text said God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. And that's what, as we get to the end of this, very interesting to me is in the first case, God said, look, open your eyes. You can see a hundred great things I've given you, but I've holding one thing back. Promise you. You need that one thing held back. And they're like, well, as long as it's there, I got to try it. And what happened? Their eyes were opened. In both cases, they didn't open their own eyes. Their eyes got opened. In the one case in the garden, having to pursue the thing God held back led for the devil effectively to open their eyes to shame and guilt and sorrow and fear and despair. How many of you know God's holding some things back from you for your good? How many of you know that everything God is holding back from you is for your good? That's the first story. In the second story, she didn't open her own eyes either, except God did it. God did it because she at least was able to cry to him. Now, let me give you a few New Testament verses and then we'll be done. Go with me to John 10. A few things I want you to think about. Number one, we live in an age where Jesus Christ, the centerpiece of our worship and our lives, came to this earth to provide an abundant life for you. He came and he gave his life to provide you with abundant forgiveness, abundant redemption, abundant purpose, and abundant prophecy, uh, promises. He came to give you brightness and life. And even if life is dark and hard and things are going on, the depth of that well, even when it's small, even when it looks small in your dark and difficult days, the depth of the well of Jesus is bottomless. And many times we see it everywhere. You see both the stories, they're opposite and they fit. Sometimes life tries to keep you from seeing the abundance of Jesus, but it's bottomless, limitless water. And other times God shows it to you in so many places that if you're careful, that's all you will see. John chapter 10 for just a moment. Love this word abundance because God is the God of abundance, depth, 
answers and help. And the devil works in the situation of what's not there. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. You can articulate who the thief is in John 10. There's a lot of imagery here of shepherd and sheep and gate and different stuff. But if you assign that to the devil, you'd be well on the right track. I mean, he, he later talks specifically about their father, the devil, in a very similar text. Satan comes to steal. Satan comes to kill. Satan comes to destroy. But he always works in the dark spaces. And that's not supposed to work, right? It's supposed to be like, well, that's dumb. I mean, Satan's like, ooh, do this thing God doesn't want you to do. I'm not going to do that. Or look at all this apparent dismissal of God and sorrow. That's like, we're not supposed to stare at it. But I do. I do. I stare at the blue. And I need to change. And it starts with understanding that even though this projector doesn't come near showing you the vibrance of that yellow light, it is the most radiant color in existence. And Jesus is the Christ of verse 10. I came to give you life, verse 10, and I came that you may have it abundantly or in abundance. So to talk about that first thing as we get near the end, let's talk about that first thing. Hebrews 12 says, fixing your eyes on Jesus. Do you remember that? Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. And then it says, to not be entangled in those sins that so easily entangle us. Do you get the connection? I don't want to make this too simplistic, but that's the way I'm very simplistic. When my eyes are focused on the depth of the well of Jesus, even in the wilderness, on the vibrance of the promises of God in the days of glory, when they're focused on the yellow, they're not focused on the blue. But if you're not focused on the yellow, the only thing left is the blue. Does that make sense? You go, I just won't look at either one of them. You don't get that option. You don't get that option. Two colors, that's it. If I'm not focused on the yellow, there's only one thing left for me, big or little. That's where my mind is. That's why it says in Hebrews 12, when your eyes are fixed on Jesus, you will not be entangled in these sins. But when they're not fixed on Jesus, you don't just get some stasis mode where you're like, I think I'll choose neither for a while. There is no neither. And that's the first thing that we need to know. That's why we pray. Great comments in Bible class today. That's why we pray and we read and we think on God. That's why Sundays are the most important days of every week because you start in praise of our great King and our Savior and you leave in brightness. And then on the other side, I'm going to read a little bit from Romans 8. You're welcome to go to Romans 8. I read out of this, this Bible a second time through on a different version, a more of a reader version, I think, than a study version. But I want you to, you're welcome to follow along there. But I'm going to read Romans 8. I think Romans 8 is so fitting here, especially in times in the wilderness and times when you're like, I'm having trouble seeing Jesus right now and things are really tough. And, and I kind of feel like I don't know that I can find the well. Well, you may not be able to. How about calling on the strength of the Lord? That may be a little better than you trying to do it on your own. But Romans 8, we know pretty well. So I'm going to begin in verse 29. And I'm reading from this, this version here. It's different than usual. But I want you to listen beginning in verse 29. Listen carefully. This is about the wilderness. Romans 8, 29. Look at your version, but, but listen. Listen to how this is reading. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. That's who we are. Now watch this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. How, who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Now, that's all the setup. Now, listen carefully to the next piece. That's the blessing setup. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean, now listen, this is why I read this version. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? What a great question. Does that mean God isn't here anymore? 
when this is my life right now, this right here, this was great. I love those years. They went by like that. This is my life. Is God not here anymore? Is there no source of water? He said, listen, can anything separate his own people from him? Does it mean he no longer loves us when you're in the wilderness? He says, verse 36, as the scripture says, for your sake, we're killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, even those things, even persecution and martyrdom, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor our fears today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's awesome. Now, we usually add to that, you know, the only person he doesn't mention there is you. You're the only one who can separate yourself from God. Yeah, that's true. That's what our stories are about. Our stories are about choices that people made. But I just need you to understand, when your life is full of blessings, that is God at work. And when he tells you no on even the littlest of things, that is God at work. When you're in a place of darkness, sadness, fear, and woe, that is in some ways God at work. And he is all Ways there. He is always there. And the depth of the well will always be enough to help you weather the wilderness, which is what happened. He didn't go, oh, Hagar, that was just a little 10 minute test. You did well. I thought you were going to fail for a minute. And you started crying and I got you. He didn't say that. He didn't take her out of the wilderness. He just gave her water to bear it. He gave her a source of life to bear it. Eventually, eventually, it's such an interesting story. In the first story, eventually, they lost the garden forever. In the second story, eventually, she emerged from the wilderness and they became a great nation. Like, think about that. It's all the same thing. It's just a matter of what our focus is on. I've got one prayer for you and then we're done. Go to Ephesians 1. I've read this from this podium a handful of times and Lord willing, a handful more. Folding up my sheet here. Ephesians chapter 1. Remember, our, our kind of sub-theme in all of this is opening your eyes. The devil opened Adam and Eve's eyes through a lure of the small... God opened Hagar's eyes to see the power of the specific. And I pray that your eyes are open too. Verse 15, let's read. Ephesians 1, 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and and revelation in the knowledge of him. He wants you to see him. He wants you to know him. He wants you to know his nearness. Check out the rest. We'll just do two verses here. I pray that, this is my prayer for you and I pray yours for me. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Period. That is all light. It is unapproachable, perfect, radiant light. It is the hope of how he has called you. It is the glory of the inheritance that you possess, and it is the power of him in your life. Open your eyes and you will see. And you go, so I'll never see the darkness again? No, that's, that's not the point. The point is you will see it differently. You will see it differently. And in that way, you get to make a choice and God will look for a choice. He will save those who choose the light. He's promised to do so. The light is Jesus. Do you choose Jesus? Are your eyes fixed on him? Wilderness or garden, the challenge is the same. Faith looks the same. If we can help you to put your eyes on him, obey him, do so now as we stand and sing.